All right. So there's probably about 10 of us on this morning. This conference will now be recorded. So, so good morning to all 10 people. <laughs> uh, we got, we've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of folks that are digging out, and uh, I think the ice sort of took everybody by surprise uh, when it rained on top last night. But um, 6 a.m. we had an assessment, and we decided that 10 a.m. would work. So for those that aren't here, or those that are still digging out, we wish you the best of luck, and um, hopefully the sunshine will help. The sunshine's very bright, and it's pretty strong this morning, so hopefully that'll help. So it's Thursday, December 17th. This is actually our last session of uh, open session for 2020. Um, yeah, no, it's a, that's a shame, right? Yeah. So uh, let's start off with uh, rising for the pledge and uh, observing our moment of silence. Uh, for all things that are legitimate this morning, including those that are continue to be on the front lines of uh, COVID and for the safety of getting out of this snowstorm this morning. Uh, I got to always do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United yes. States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we got a couple folks on here. Before we go into our personal priority carols, let's, um, well, I'll tell you what, let's just, they, they've been on for a little bit. They can hold for a little bit longer. Let's just hold off. Uh, let me go down through the list here and uh, hear from everybody, and then we'll, we'll go in. We've got a, we've got a retirement, a, a gentleman to, uh, to pay tribute to on his retirement. And in the middle of a snow and ice storm, we're going to talk about a big fish. That's pretty legitimate. Uh, so let's start with uh, number two district and see if Weaver is somehow dug out this morning. Commissioner Weaver, good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> um, good morning to Carroll County. Bright morning. Looks good. Everything's positive. I want to start with the, uh, I guess, community college, even though uh, enrollment is down a little bit. They are doing much better than most of the community colleges uh, across the country. And uh, that's positive. And when you start looking at where other community colleges are, ours is uh, doing very well. So uh, I'm really glad to report that. Um, and they have some very unique programs coming up. Um, another note, Santa will be at the Farm Museum from uh, noon to four, Saturday and Sunday. And this is your opportunity to get to see Santa, get a picture from a distance. But they have uh, put together very well. And then he's going to have to head back to the North Pole for a big event coming up next week. So, uh, <clears throat> he'll be there. But on a totally different note, uh, I think Saturday, we will be, uh, most of us, I think people will be lay, uh, part of the wreaths across America, whether it be laying uh, millions of wreaths at different locations across the country at 12 o'clock this Saturday. And uh, just to want to make people aware of some things here, there are 10 bunches of balsam, known as balsam bouquets, that go into each wreath each representing the special qualities of our veterans, uh, their belief in the greater God, their love for each other, their strength, work ethic, and character, their honesty and integrity, humility, selflessness, and modesty, their ambitions and aspirations, their optimism for America, their concern for the future, their pride in their duties, their hopes and dreams didn't always come true, but they left them with no regrets. Uh, green stand for the longevity and endurance. The red bow stands for the great sacrifice. The forest set stands for purity and simplicity. And the circular shapes uh, stands for eternity. And the, now this wreath is a symbol of honor, respect, and victory. And if you can't make it to the cemeteries uh, this week, stop and pay your uh, uh, <clears throat> and honor those people uh, at the various cemeteries. So. I just wanted to take a minute to uh, 
let people know why wreaths across America are out there. Those wreaths will stay on the graves until sometime in January. So uh, that's all I have. And I know uh, this is a major event. Uh, we started in Carroll County at um, Deer Park Church in uh, about five years ago. And it has caught on everywhere. So uh, thank you for all people helping and uh, honoring our veterans. All right, thanks, Dick. Uh, District Three, Commissioner Frazier, good morning. Good morning, thank you. Um, this past, uh, I think it was Monday, I went to speak at Cub Scout Pack 631. First thing I wanna say, is that when you go, before you went into the building, you got temperature checked, they wrote your name down, wrote temperature down. Every single person had a mask, everything was spread out. But really what I was most impressed about about their COVID procedures, everyone brought their own little chair. So they had those foldable, foldable chairs, most of them had. Some of them did, they some of them bought stools and stuff. But they put the chair away, they're not touching any of the stuff that's around there. And there's hand sanitizer. So they're doing a good job with the COVID um, procedures there. I have to say, I thought I would get in there. They asked me to talk about what a commissioner does and why I was the best commissioner. Okay, they didn't ask about that part, but about what a commissioner does. And... Um, and I thought I'd be in and out like 15 minutes. These kids were really engaged. There was questions after questions after questions. It was really, really good. I was very, very impressed with the questions, their understanding. I was, I, I was very impressed. I was there talking for like 45 minutes. I thought I was like, why answer something? I was talking so long. Maybe not that long. But I, <laughs> but I went really, really well. So I'm very impressed. Thank you for, for, for uh, Cub Scout Pack 631 for that. Um, that's actually all I basically have to say, except be careful, dig out, take your time. I know so I, when I was shoveling out this morning, I shoveled for like 15 minutes, took a short break, shoveled 15 minutes, because as you get a little bit older, and, and Weaver knows this for a fact, you know, you got to take a break every now and then. So you, you shovel, you break, you shovel, you break, but you get it all done. All right, take it easy, stay healthy, stay safe, keep wearing your mask. Thank you. You just have to be in shape, uh, Mr. Fraser. Wow, I'm not even going to get involved in that one. Uh, okay, let's go to district number four and say good morning to Eric Boucher and see what's happening in the Winfield, Woodbine, Mount Airy area. Good morning, colleagues. Mr. Fraser, I'm surprised you didn't tell those students that you wrestled with the uh, your colleague. There we go. I wound up going back to the farmer's market. I got to talk about the farmer's market. There's that dorky commissioner from district four. And my parents heard it, and they had to go up and do some shopping at the market. I took them out to breakfast at a local establishment. So we had an absolutely wonderful day, and I encourage other people to do the same thing. Also, I'd like to talk about the tree farmers. Here we go. First, I want to thank the Carroll County Times and Dylan Schlagel, if I pronounce his name correct, I hope so, for this photo. Air tree farmers in Carroll County are some of the best in the state. I think we lead the state as far as counties for trees. Uh, some of the farms sold out trees within two weeks. I think this is endemic of people being stuck in their houses, wanting to do things with their families. So they came into our county. They enjoyed the outing one uh, each day. They're out there cutting trees, bringing economic growth to our county. And also, we're, I think yesterday, MPP did a special about our tree farmers in Carroll County. One of them up in Union Bridge, which is my district. So I really must give kudos to our local farmers. A lot of people don't realize how many Christmas trees we grow in this county, but it's a major economic driver and ag uh, business in this county. So I want to thank all those farmers and show our sincere appreciation to all those people outside of our county that come into Carroll County and spend their money here for our farmers. So thank you very much. That was quite the, quite the photo you took there, Commissioner <laughs> Boucher. I'm not even, I'm just, between that and the Grinch and everything else, I'm, I'm just, I'm on, a, I'm on Boucher overload right now. Let's go to District 5. Whip down, 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 down yeah, the Slightsville Eldersburg area. Commissioner Rothstein, good morning. It makes it very difficult to uh, follow Commissioner Boucher with some of these photos, but uh, it's all good. Um, continue to shop local. Uh, you know, let's continue and, and take care of Main Streets as a, uh, Commissioner Wentz said that let's take care of Main Street and not Wall Street uh, as we move forward into this holiday, continued holiday season. 
uh, kudos to um, our uh, work crews that spent throughout the night taking care of our county and our community and cleaning the streets. Um, I'm looking outside and, you know, they came through our street two, three times and it's looking really good. So really appreciate their selfless work that they've been uh, doing uh, during these challenging times, during these, uh, the snow uh, situation. Um, again, kudos to the planning and zoning and planning team. Uh, I think we're doing very well as a board of commissioners in uh, making our decisions, uh, albeit preliminary at this point. Um, we were we are able to do it because of the uh, preparation done by the planning commission and the uh, planning director. So really uh, kudos to them in getting us uh, prepared as best they can. As Commissioner Weaver shared, the Reads Across America, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, and I'm humbled every time uh, to be able to place a wreath uh, in providing that eternal gratitude for that someone who's given their life and knowing that their family is still mourning uh, by their side or at, at their grave. So just take that moment if you're there, uh, that's great. If not, uh, understand why uh, Wreaths Across America is so important to uh, binding our communities together. Um, the, the, the last thing I just want to share is <clears throat> these are challenging times, and uh, especially um, as we're still playing through the pandemic, the, the word I, I find most often used now is melancholy. Folks are feeling melancholy in many ways. So I just ask, let's look out for each other. If you see something, say something. If you see someone down the dumps, don't just take it on your own to pick them back up do your best, but also say something in taking care of folks. Uh, this is a very, very challenging time, regardless of a pandemic or not. The pandemic just adds way on top of everything else going on. So, uh, you know, I, I, I just want us to continue to be the strong community that we are. Um, and with that said, wishing everybody a very Merry Christmas that celebrates next week and stay safe, stay healthy, and be happy with friends and family. That's all I got. All right, thanks, Ed. Well said. Uh, just a couple quick things from me. Uh, all of us had the chance to be in attendance with the Maryland Municipal League uh, last week. Uh, most, I think every mayor except for one was on there, but every, every one of our towns were represented. And as um, to, to tag on, uh, to what uh, Commissioner Rothstein said, supporting our main streets is really important. So hit, hit, hit our small towns in the next week or so and don't stop after the holidays either. Some great shops, uh, great restaurants, good stuff going on in our towns. So uh, that's, that's what makes, it's one of the things that makes Carroll County such a, a great place to, to live, work and play. Um, other than that, uh, a big shout out to everyone in the last 24 hours and their work continues uh, for keeping us safe. Uh, law enforcement, first responders, all of our roads crews, all of our guys in facilities, all of our folks in fleet to keep our uh, vehicles on the road. Everybody did a tremendous job and they, their work isn't complete yet. Uh, I, I would suspect by the end of the day, we'll be in much better shape. A little bit dicey right now. So a reminder too, if you're going out, um, maybe stay in place for a while and uh, allow our crews to get out there and allow the sun to get the sun working or get to get the salt working. Uh, it takes a, reaches a certain temperature and then that salt really starts to kick. So I think once the sun gets up and you get that glare off my head, it'll be much better. No, nobody's going to pick up. Nobody's even going to pick up on that one. That's good. Okay. Nice you today. Too easy. Too easy. <laughs> yeah. No, too easy. Okay. All right. And uh, yeah, a lot of us will be uh, participating in. Uh, there'll be a lot of folks across the county participating in Reads Across America on Saturday. Put your boots on and your mask. Drive by a cemetery, and I think whatever one you drive by at noon, you can help with. Uh, with placing a wreath. So thank you all very much for that. Uh, Commissioner Wansk, I uh, just have one additional second. Um, so I just got a. Fraser's saying no. 
uh, uh, email came in from Eldersburg in Sorrel Court. The uh, snowplow just came through, through truck 6545. The man driving did an excellent job cleaning our street and court. It's hard to maneuver that truck in a small place that has cars parked everywhere. He did an excellent job. Took his time and was careful. My husband said it was like a well choreographed ballet. Uh, please send our thanks to the driver and tell him he's doing a great job. I think that's great that people, uh, you know, we, use, we get all the complaints, but when people do something right, uh, that is true uh, uh, leadership, I think, from the citizens of Carroll County. When they take time to, to say th when things are going well. And uh, I appreciate that from Dave and Katie Copenhauer. Haver, sorry, Copenhaver. All right, good deal. Yep, sure, we'll get a lot more of that as well. That's, uh, that's we always get a lot of those, and uh, we do appreciate everybody's efforts out here. So thank you all very much, and stay safe. Um, we've got, speaking of employees and the folks that uh, continue to do a great job in the county, we are paying tribute this morning to a gentleman who has spent 35 years of his life with Carroll County government in various positions, most recently as part of our roads operations team, and then he moved to Bureau of Fleet Management and Warehouse. Uh, in Fleet, George uh, started out as an apprentice mechanic, then he went to road mechanic and then to service writer, where he has remained uh, except for a recent stint in warehouse operations. So uh, I'm gonna turn this over to Keith Vogel. I see Keith's on here this morning. Uh, Keith, you can, uh, you, you heard the kudos from all of us this morning. Uh, make sure you pass that on to all your folks there as well. Uh, we truly do appreciate their efforts. So let's uh, let's pay a little bit of tribute to Mr. Shanberger this morning, who is on here, but let's hear from Keith Vogel first. Keith, good morning. Good morning, Commissioners, and I will let them all know. Um, George Shanberger is retiring after 35 years. I worked in, with him for about five and a half. And George has been a great employee. Every time I need a hand in the department, He's filled in in parts for me when people are sick. Most recently, he's been in the warehouse for almost a year, and he was very helpful going through COVID, getting supplies. I wouldn't have been able to do it without him. So I just want to say I, I really appreciated working with him. It's been a pleasure, and I want to wish him the best in his retirement. Thanks, Keith. Uh, Doug, I see you're on here too, Doug Brown. Thank you, uh, commissioners. Thank you all. Yeah, I, I, I'd first say that George is uh, a selfless guy. So you all know that we take uh, COVID-19 very seriously here at the county. So the reason you don't see George's face is because he wasn't feeling well this morning. So instead of coming in and potentially impacting anybody else, George called in on his phone. And while I'd love to show you his picture, I admire the man. Uh, Keith um, said that absolutely keeping the supplies in stock. I would call George when COVID first started in March. And I said, you know, George, uh, we need masks or we need this. And you all know that those things weren't there. George would spend hours locating them, tracking them down, getting them in for us, whether it was gloves, masks, or whatever. Then he'd haul it in and he'd deliver it, uh, put on his N95 and go to the sites and make sure folks had their stuff. And uh, he, is truly um, a wonderful person who is flexible in all things that we do and a true credit to our community. Uh, and uh, I just personally will miss him, will miss his 35 years of experience. And, uh, you know, uh, another one of our team members that we love is gone, but we certainly uh, wish him well. Thank you, Commissioner Williams. Thanks, Doug. Uh, George, let's hear from you. You're you're on the you're on the call here this morning. Good morning, George. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, uh, let me say first of all, I I enjoyed my 35 years here at the county. Um, it's it's very hard to say goodbye. Um, it's been it's been a great opportunity. I've 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 plowed many blizzards, graders, and dump trucks and. Uh, when I started in the road crew, I've kept equipment and running for the county. Uh, it's been a very, very challenging 35 years, but I'm always up for a challenge. And I'm hoping retirement is not a challenge. That is, is a free ride coast. But uh, life has its way, like this morning. You know, I got up and 
went out and did my driveway, which everybody else, we had a heck of a time. Uh, I got into work here this morning, pulled into the parking lot, and I'm, I'm sitting here now. Um, I, I checked my temperature. It was 100.1. I'm thinking, I don't know if I'm just overheated or what, but I don't want to take the chance of making anybody sick. Um, it, it's been a wonderful opportunity here, and I really, really do hate to say goodbye. Well, George, we certainly do appreciate it. Uh, I want each of the commissioners uh, to get a chance here to, to talk uh, directly to you. So uh, I'm going to start with Commissioner Weaver. Dick, um, go ahead. Uh, George, um, you know, I've talked to several people, and they um, two things come through uh, with you, honest and hardworking. And, uh, you know, that is the backbone of Carroll County. Uh, I think you're going to see um, – why businesses come here is just because of people like you in this county who are always honest, hardworking, uh, not selfish by any means. Uh, you're always doing what's best for the, the everyone and for the good of all. But so I just want to say thank you. And, uh, you know, I hope your next 35 years uh, is as uh, good to you as the last 35 have been. And uh, I just wish you all the best. Thanks, Dick. Commissioner Frazier, Dennis. George, just want to add my thanks to everyone else. Just thank you for 35 years in Carroll County. Did a, a, a different number of jobs here. From what I understand, you did them all really well. Thank you for that. We will be missing your institutional knowledge. When someone who's done as much as you have throughout the county leaves, it leaves a really big gap. Your shoes are going to be hard to fill, but that's up to Doug and all to try to find somebody to fill them. <laughs> so, but thank you very much for all you've done with, for Carroll County. Mr. Boucher. Good morning, George, and Merry Christmas to you. I want to say that even though we commissioners make decisions, it's individuals such as yourself that actually impact our constituents. It's individuals like you that execute the policies and, and do the work that affects people's lives. I'm one of those commissioners that gets his hands dirty in my career, and I love coming out and visiting you guys. I enjoy visiting the warehouse and fleet services. Yesterday, I seen a video of the guys turning wrenches, putting the plows on. I love all that stuff. You guys are the heart and soul of this county government. You are the individuals that impact people's lives. I also seen on this briefing paper that you have two beagles. You like fishing and hunting. <clears throat> I love fishing and hunting, too, and I hope as you go into retirement, you can do a lot more fishing and hunting and enjoy yourself. God bless to you. And Commissioner Rostein, Ed. Thanks. And uh, mo most has already been said. Um, again, George, appreciate the selfless work and persistence in uh, getting the job done. And that's what it sounds like uh, you've been doing for 35 years is uh, when when tasked, when asked, you just, you know, knuckle down and get the job done. So I really, truly appreciate that. Um, from a, from a military perspective, I always look at the tactical and the strategic look. The strategic is enjoy your retirement. The tactical is what's happening today. Take care of yourself. You have 100.1 temperature. Just make sure you're taking care of yourself. If necessary, get tested. And uh, hopefully you'll get through this very, very quickly. So again, thank you very much uh, from me and from all of us. Thanks. And George, finally for me, just congratulations on uh, a great career here in Carroll. Uh, you are what makes this county great. There's no question about it. Uh, we wish uh, both you, uh, both your kids and your wife, Bonnie, the best uh, for a great holiday season. And uh, retirement's a good thing, I can tell you. I was retired for about three months, and I really enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to the next time I get to do that. So enjoy it. Enjoy your, enjoy your family, and on behalf of all of us in Carroll County and every citizen, thank you very, very much for your 35 years of dedicated service, George. It's truly been appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, I would like to add that uh, without the other great employees that work for Carroll County, the challenges that come before me would have been uh, uh, probably a lot more tasks. You have a great bunch of employees. Thank you, George, and we appreciate that. And again, that's what makes that's what makes this place so great. When you can talk about one another like that, 
that's fantastic. So uh, good luck. Stay safe out there. Godspeed, George, to you and your family. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, now we're going to go from snow, sleet, freezing rain, and all the rest of that crap to a big fish. So, uh, Jeff, are you on here this morning? Yes, Jeff is on this morning. Jeff must have slid down the hill and and uh, got on this morning. So I'm going to turn this one over to you, Jeff, our Director of Parks and Rec, Jeff Daggetts. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Thanks for having me today. Uh, very happy to announce that uh, at the end of November, we finished our fifth annual Big Fish Contest down at Piney Run Park. And you have a picture there of this year's winner, Mr. John Brashear. Uh, John is a former Carroll County resident. He lives in Yakima, Washington, which is southeast of Seattle. And John was visiting some friends when he stopped at Piney Run and he caught a striped bass that measured 41 and a quarter inches long and 20, over 27 pounds. Now, the great thing about this photo is that the gentleman who is sitting in the boat behind him is Travis Hankins, who was last year's winner. And Travis is not looking too pleased in the picture when he sees the size of the fish that John caught. And uh, at one point during the year, Travis was on the leaderboard. And this contest seems to get more competitive every year. And this year was no exception to that. Uh, the contest runs from March 1st through November 30th. We had four lead changes during the month of November, three during the last weekend of the contest. And it was literally the last day of the contest that John caught the winning fish. And we had a picture with him down at Piney Run Park, down at the boathouse. And we have our great big fish check. And also in the picture is Deb Rotman, who is the park superintendent at Piney Run. So congratulations to John. He was the winner of a $1,000 prize. Uh, his catch this year did not break the all-time record. The all-time record is a 45-inch long fish by uh, Richard Newwiller, but still, it's pretty close to that and very impressive catch. So we're very happy to announce that and share that thousand dollars with them just before Christmas. I hope he bought Travis lunch or something. <laughs> he actually talked about possibly splitting the uh, the prize with Travis because he was in Travis's boat using one of Travis's rods. So we all thought that was very generous of him, but we weren't going to hold him to it. Okay. Well, well done. Uh, go ahead, Dennis. I was going to say, I'm very impressed that we bring people from all across the country into this contest now. In our fifth year, someone from the state of Washington is coming in from here. This contest is getting very well known. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. It's great for tourism. We're bringing people in, and there is some fantastic fishing at Piney Run. So the word is out. There you go. You guys joke about how many thousands of people are watching us. Be careful what you say. I mean, it could be tuned in on the West Coast this morning. Just saying. All right. Grand Continental Fishing Contest. <laughs> yeah, <there you> go. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Thanks for doing that. Uh, we always do appreciate the uh, – and we have fun with this big fish contest. And we look forward to next year as well. And please pass on our congratulations to all that were involved there. Uh, good stuff. I will do that. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. Uh, I think that's all we have for Priority Carol right now. We'll probably hit a couple things here before we sign off the air this morning. But right now we're going to move into COVID. And uh, Ed Singer also slid down out of Manchester this morning. And Ed is on here uh, to give us the uh, – the latest updates, uh, as far as uh, from Annapolis, uh, we do know that the governor will be having another press conference this afternoon at 5 p.m. So uh, last week's uh, press conference focused on all things vaccine. So um, let's see where we, where, where we go this afternoon. Uh, but Ed, good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Um, Boy, <laughs> it's been a week, and uh, the uh, I guess I just want to start off by sharing with you um, 
at the beginning of the pandemic, we, we, we had a very significant outbreak that uh, we were involved with and, and, and our numbers here in Carroll County were fairly high, but throughout the rest of the pandemic, our, our metrics have been uh, pretty well below the state average for the most part as we've, as we've gone through things. And, and uh, I think it's largely because folks here in Carroll County have been doing the right things and, and, and following the, uh, the guidelines and the rules and whatnot. Um, I, I just want to point out that today is, is the first time it, it, since uh, early in the pandemic where our positivity rate in Carroll County has exceeded what the state's positivity rate is. So just that reminder that the people need to stay uh, vigilant in what we're doing to try to mitigate the spread of COVID until the vaccine gets out there and gets widely distributed. And, and uh, you know, we're in this for several more months. Um, our, our positivity rate, our seven day average as of today is, is 8.4%, which is uh, the, the, the highest since, since very early in the uh, pandemic. Uh, the state average is 7.7%. Our, our cases per 100,000 stands at uh, 39.6. And, and that's uh, one of the highest uh, numbers that we've had there also. Um, I know that I, I've uh, talked to some of you offline and, and we may have even talked last week about the hospital being under strain. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit as we get into the present presentation. But I just wanted to um, kind of share that this morning, remind people that it's very important to continue to wear your mask. Uh, even after people get vaccinated, it's gonna be important for us to continue social distancing, wearing masks and whatnot, because even though the vaccine is, is highly effective based on the studies, um, it, it's it's still going to be important that we keep these mitigation uh, strategies in effect until we've defeated this virus. And it's going to take some months to get through that. So uh, just reminding people to uh, follow the guidelines, wash your hands, um, limit uh, large gatherings, and, and uh, do the best that you can to help us get through this. Been a lot of uh, questions about, um, I want to start today talking about the vaccine. There's been a lot of a lot of questions about this. We've been getting a lot of phone calls. I think uh, you know other folks have been getting a lot of phone calls about uh, people wanting to sign up to get vaccinated and that type of thing. And I know Maggie shared with you last week the, the survey that we did. And you know it's it's interesting. There's probably about half the people really want to get vaccinated, and the other half the people don't want to get vaccinated. And, and I want to encourage everybody. You know, as soon as the vaccine's available and it's appropriate for me to get it, I'm I'm going to be be getting vaccinated because I really think that's the only way we're going to bring this to it to an end. The science is good. You know, it's, it's been a, a uh, rapid process, but it's, it's not that uh, we, we haven't done the appropriate studies to, to make sure that the vaccine's safe and effective. Um, so I, I would encourage everybody to get vaccinated. But right now, kind of where we stand, the, the hospitals and, and our long-term care facilities where we have uh, some of the most vulnerable, vulnerable people, are the places that are being focused on. And that's uh, being taken on by the hospitals are vaccinating their own um, their own staff and the uh, some large pharmacy chains are, are gonna be vaccinating the staff and the, um, and the residents at our long-term care facilities. The health department's responsibility, and we're supposed to receive some vaccine on December the 22nd. Uh, we don't know how much at this point in time and, and uh, not sure if that's gonna slide uh, one way or the other, but the uh, we're supposed to be receiving the Moderna vaccine, and, and and both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine are very similar in in, in their effectiveness. Um, but we're supposed to be uh, receiving the Moderna vaccine, and um, when the the first priority on this is going to be our first responders, our EMS, our, our law enforcement, and, and other folks like that. I, I've had a lot of physicians' offices and dental offices and whatnot. They're calling our call center asking, well, how do we get on the list? We're going to make sure that we get the information out there when it's the when, when it's those individuals turn in the queue because we want to get everybody vaccinated. And, and we'll, we'll have a there's a uh, there's a, a software system called prep mod where people have appointments. We'll have closed pods and, and we'll get everybody vaccinated. But uh, we're going to be inviting people as it's their turn in the queue. The state's supposed to be providing us some additional guidance because they're there are quite a number of people in 1A and, and we know law enforcement and EMS and, and, and some of our frontline staff that are doing testing and, and uh, vaccinations are gonna be the first ones that are gonna get uh, vaccinated with the vaccine that the health department receives. And then medical providers and, and uh, 
and other folks are, are going to be getting vaccinated. So it's it's uh, how that Group 1A breaks down is is um, is, is still uh, being worked out. And we will be reaching out to those groups of people who, who will be uh, vaccinated uh, when, when, when their turn comes along. It's going to be a while before we get to the general public. Uh, 1B is people uh, at significantly more risk of uh, contracting COVID-19 and having negative health outcomes. We're, we're not there yet. And that's, gonna, that's even going to be a while yet. So I'm just asking people to be patient. Um, the other thing that I want to share with you guys as a board of commissioners is this is kind of an unprecedented even public health response for us. We've done mass vaccination clinics before, um, and we, we've had to do other types of response as a, as a local health department. But right now, with, with so the challenge we're really facing is there seems to be really a, a shortage of, uh, of uh, providers available, whether it's nurses or, or, or other type of health care providers. And, and we're facing continuing to run testing, which I think is important from helping the standpoint to know who, who potentially has COVID-19 and preventing the uh, transmission in the community by identifying those folks and trying to run mass vaccination clinics at the same time. And, you know, it's the same type of logistical folks that we would use for one and the other. And, and we're trying to balance that. And, and I just want to let you all know that our priority is going to be on vaccinations. Um, my, my, my first thing that I'm going to pull from, we're, we're, we're trying to find folks from outside the health department to help us. We're we, we've working with your emergency management and whatnot on, on getting vaccinators and, and uh, folks in place. But our, our first priority is going to be these vaccinations. If we have to, we, we may have to reduce some of the services that we have here at the health department to make the vaccinations happen. And, uh, you know, even if we have to dip into some of the testing that we're doing and, and pull from some of those folks, the vaccine has to be a priority because that's what's going to bring this pandemic to an end for us. So um, we're working right now on trying to staff these clinics. Uh, there's been a lot of work between our staff, emergency management, and, and a lot of the county staff and our community partners on exactly what these uh, vaccination clinics are going to look like when we start doing them. We still have uh, very limited uh, information on how much vaccine we're getting and exactly how this is going to roll out, but we're going to be ready for it. And we're going to, uh, we're going to get the vaccine out to, to the folks that need it as soon as we uh, were able. So just wanted to cover that a bit this morning before we got into the numbers. Um, we've changed the slides a little bit. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I think uh, a couple of you had pointed out before was, well, we really need to know between the confirmed and probable cases, how many, how many cases of COVID-19 are we actually seeing in the, uh, in the community? And, um, you know, last week was an all-time high for us with uh, confirmed cases. We had 400 confirmed cases. Um, the orange that we've added on to the end of the uh, graphs give you a good picture of, um, of the total number of cases in Carroll County. It includes those probable cases. We figured we'd stack it. So we were close to 500 total cases uh, last week and the week before. Um, the, the probable cases lag a little bit in coming in, so... You may actually see that that line for the week of December six grow as we uh, as we as we uh, present to you again next week or, or the next time that we uh, we actually get together. Uh, this is our probable cases by week, and the fourteen day rolling average of our COVID nineteen cases in the community, which uh, pretty much just still on that upward trend that we don't like seeing. breakdown by by the age group and and uh by, by week really not a lot significant to say about that other than you know since uh i, I guess early november we we prior to early november we really didn't see a lot of cases in in, in uh kids on well youth that are under the age of 18 and and um since the beginning of november we've generally seen more than uh 20 cases a week in, in the under 18 age group. And this is just breaking it down so that you can see, see the trends by those ages. Uh, I mentioned the hospital um, for about a two and a half week period. Every day uh, the hospital had more COVID patients than they had had at, at, at any other um, point in time. It, well, they, they, the number of COVID cases, cases increased every day for, for about two and a half weeks, and the hospital was really feeling the strain. 
the ICU was full, the hospital was full, and they essentially were uh, they were take, doing a great job of taking care of their patients, but they had folks that were waiting in the ED for beds in the hospital, um, which is not a good thing. So they were they they've been under a lot of stress the last two and a half three weeks. Uh, fortunately, um, today and yesterday we've seen a slight downward trend in the number of uh, COVID cases, but the total number of uh, of COVID patients in the hospital has um, exceeded at any, any point in the pandemic, even during the uh, during the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the number of cases they had last week were were more than, than any other point during this uh, pandemic, which is concerning. Um, this is our hospitalizations by week, and this is uh, the, the, the the graphic over here with the with the text kind of tells you this graph uh, shows hospitalizations, COVID positive individuals in Carroll County in any hospital, and it's only counted once. It's whether a person's been hospitalized or not. So whether they're hospitalized for 20 days or hospitalized for one day, they're, they're counted one time. And, and uh, you know, we, we've, uh, we've seen quite, quite a number of hospitalizations of county residents over, over this last few weeks. And our deaths, and it's, it's still concerning that, uh, you know, we, we had hit that peak early in the, uh, early in the pandemic with the number of deaths and, and, um, in the last last month or month and a half, we, we've uh, we've again seen these deaths climb. Uh, last week we had a total of six deaths. Only one of them was somebody out in the community, and, and six were facility related deaths. And you know we've been having a lot of discussions with the um, with with folks at the state level about uh, these vulnerable folks in the nursing facilities, and it's really hard to do anything about it when we've got so much spread in the community at the rate that we've got right now. Uh, staff go home, staff, you know, staff have kids in, in daycare, uh, staff interact with their family. And, and uh, it's not that the, that the residents in the nursing home are somehow contracting this other than, you know, if they, if they get sent out somewhere, it's possible they could bring it into the nursing home that way. But generally it's the staff that are bringing these into the facilities and we're trying to, uh, to look at ways that we can try to mitigate that and, and to, uh, we, we, our, our outbreak numbers in these facilities are growing again and again obviously the deaths related with these facilities are growing and, and that's that's concerning and we've got to figure out how to do our best to mitigate that again just a reminder to slow the spread things we've been telling you for the last several months uh, especially with the holidays coming uh, avoiding the large large gatherings again I want to encourage people to interact and socially interact with your your family members, especially people who are older, but to try to do it in a virtual way as much as you can because uh, large gatherings, it, it, we're seeing a lot of people in the same families who, who are spreading it to each other. And just a reminder, um, you, you can still take our survey and there's information out on our website about the results. Any questions? Yeah, Ed, I have one. Um, it's concerning to me the under 18, the number of kids that are getting this. Do, are you seeing any secondary effects from that uh, in the, in that group, or is it too soon to know, or you're not testing, or even know about it? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by secondary effects, but if you're talking about, I mean, a lot a lot of times if the if the younger person is the index case. Uh, the whole family's getting it. So it's, you know, if, if grandma and grandpa are, are living in the same household with uh, the younger kids, or if they're, um, if they're, uh, they're, they're the daycare, they're the care provider for the, for the, for the kids after school or during school or, or whatever it happens to be, um, it, it's, they, they can potentially spread it to those, those older family members. So we're seeing a lot of spread in this amongst families and especially household members. And uh, so if that's the secondary effects you're talking about, yes, we're definitely seeing that. No, I'm, I'm looking, uh, you know, long range effects uh, to the uh, individual for like heart or lung issues, uh, any of that showing up or not? Well, it's, it's hard to say what the long-term impacts are gonna be because we've only had this disease for, for less than a year and, and uh, we're, we're, we're not gonna know the, the lasting effects. I mean, obviously there's certain things you can see when, when, when people have we don't see as many of these folks hospitalized. Obviously, they're not as much risk as older people, but 
it does cause scarring in the lungs, and and if you if you uh, if you do imaging and things of that nature, you're gonna you're gonna see it. So I just uh, you know we're really not gonna know what the long term effects are of this. You know, you think back to when smoking was a, was an issue back in the uh, in the 50s and 60s, and you really didn't start seeing the long term effects of smoking on on people's lungs until um, until many years after that happened, and it took us a long time as a society to realize it. I, I really can't tell you what the long term impacts are going to be on these uh, on kids, and 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 I think it's more of an issue with adolescents and young adults, where where they're having some. Uh, some measurable um, heart and and, uh, and lung issues that that they're that they're going to have to deal with a long ways down the road. But we're not going to know what that is until the time passes and we can actually see it and measure it. All right, anything else for Ed while we've got him on here? We're gonna we're gonna realize about a two week break here now uh, for the holidays. We won't have session again now, I don't think until, I think it's the 4th, January the 4th. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be making sure that we get the, the, the numbers and we'll share it uh, amongst the team here so that we can uh, make sure folks are still engaged there. And Ed, you, you give your daily reports, I believe to uh, the media, Carroll County Times, uh, I think, think typically has it in there on a daily basis. So uh, I believe, is that correct? The Times generally has that information. It's posted on our website as well. Right. And I've been giving the uh, Board of Education a, a, a daily update, and I've been uh, copying uh, you, Commissioner Wance, and Roberto on that. And if there is if there is regular information that the – I mean, it's, it's available on our website. That's probably the easiest right. way to get it. Maggie yep. updates that every day. But uh, anything you guys think you need to see, just let me know. Um, we can continue to send you PowerPoints the next couple of weeks on on Thursday so that you have an update as to where, where the, what these numbers look like and just to keep you in the loop and anything that we think is significant. So uh, I, I think I, I think that's probably the best way to do it. Okay. Yep, that was my last one, making sure folks continue to sign on to our websites. And uh, if you send those PowerPoints, Chris is nodding that he'll get it on our website too to be able to share that. So, Dennis? Yeah, and I have one comment, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong about this. But as we go down for, through the age groups, those numbers are more misleading than the, than the numbers for the older people because the only people that are actually getting tested are the people that have been in contact with someone that is that has COVID or COVID-like symptoms or they have symptoms themselves. And the younger you are, the less you're showing the symptoms and you may be asymptomatic. So when people are out there saying that the people in the, in the schools aren't getting the COVID, you really can't say that unless we test all the people in the schools because if they're being asymptomatic, it's not showing up and they're not getting tested, so you've got no way to know. That's why I think the spread is as bad as it is because the younger people who don't show aren't getting tested. And I'm not saying we have the facilities to test everybody, but until we have that, the younger you are, the, those, age, those categories are, the more misleading those numbers are. Would you say that's correct or would you say I'm way off base here? No, I, I don't think you're way off base, and the the spreading by people who are asymptomatic is is a huge problem. It's been a huge problem since the very beginning. That's how we wound up with some of these large outbreaks in in some of the nursing facilities because people who were asymptomatic that were staffed wound up spreading the disease without knowing it. And, and I, I've known a number of people from it doesn't matter what the age group is. Some that have been hit very hard by this disease, and some think that oh, I got a cold. So so it's really we really need to be cautious of anything that might be symptomatic of this disease and, and, and also in, in following the, uh, the guidance to try to mitigate the, the spread. And, and you're right. It's, it's the, the, the kids are like less likely to show any significant symptoms of this. And, and um, you know, without testing, without doing surveillance testing, which I don't think anybody has the capacity to do in, in, in any jurisdiction, um, without without doing extensive surveillance testing, you really don't know how much it's spreading amongst uh, the younger age groups because they, they're probably less likely to be uh, significantly sick from this. All right, anything else for Ed? All right, as always, Ed, we continue to appreciate uh, all the efforts that you and your staff are doing. 
Uh, you're you're going to have additional challenges, as you said, because of the vaccines now. So you are doing a great job over there, and uh, we, we truly do appreciate it. And uh, again, we'll be off the air for about two weeks with our open sessions through the holidays. But make sure you check the websites of both the health department, our website, and you can get the latest uh, from them. Uh, that's probably the best way to get it. And certainly, uh, as we said, some of the media has it as well. So we'll, we'll make sure everybody continues to get that. All right, Ed, thank you. Thanks, commissioners, and thanks again for your support. All right, we're going to move into our relief fund and where we are with that. And uh, only got a couple weeks to spend the money. That's where we are with it. Uh, but we'll turn it over to County Administrator Roberta Windham, who apparently slid uphill to get here from Eldersburg this morning. Roberta, good morning. Yep. Um, and, um, and and just so you know, the next open session will be January 7th. Um, Seven. Not counting the work session we have next Tuesday on the 22nd. I missed it um, by that much. Yeah, no, well, you didn't have a calendar in front of you. Yeah, no, that's all good. Um, so, yeah, we continue to spend our money. Um, the projects are winding down. We're done with, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to hazard a guess on the percentage, but most of them. At this point, the um, lobby um, and, uh, main entrance to the county office building is about to be complete. Uh, that shall be opened officially on the on the fourth again, um, but the work will have been done uh, prior to the end of December. Um, but with the holidays, there's no no reason to open it until the fourth, and um, and and the other. Two, two big uh, building construction projects related to our dispatch centers are also moving along in in a in expedient manner, ready to be done by the um, 30th as well. So at this point, we're just in um, in cleanup wrap up mode, and uh, there's really no new news um, from the uh, presentation we gave last week about how all the money was, you know, being spent. So unless you have any other questions. The only other thing is um, the state money associated with the restaurant relief, which really isn't CRF. It's not the federal money. So if, if there aren't any CRF questions, I'll turn it over to Jack for state questions. Okay, not seeing any green lights. So Jack, if you'll update the commissioners on where we stand for um, spending the, the uh, state money. Jack, you're muted. Uh, he's got the yeah. Probably a gear wheel thing. Gear wheel, yep, gear wheel, Jack. Up in the right-hand corner, check the gear wheel up in the right-hand corner. Uh, check your audio session, or check your audio settings up there to make sure. I had to do that very same thing last night in a meeting I was in. Sometimes that thing, if the computer goes down or is sleeping for a while, that thing needs to be reset. I think someone intentionally mutes it. Or it could be that. I sent Brian a message. Okay. We sent Brian a message if he's down there to help Jack out with that too. So we'll just stand by a little bit. Uh, is there a need, Roberta, while we're waiting on Jack to uh, to check in as far as the spending goes? Uh, you guys have been you guys have been uh, filling out. Is, isn't there a report that comes from the state that says that you spent your money and you are doing all that? So yeah. uh, okay, yep. we've submitted all the reports that the state has required to date. And uh, okay. Debbie can tell you when the next uh, due date is. I think it's in January sometime at this point. It should be in January. They they have been sending it out like a week prior to when it's due. So we're we're keeping a rolling um, total. We know exactly where we're at at all times. It's just a matter of putting it on their form. Okay. All right. Thanks, Deb. All right, Jack, you on? <laughs> nope, no. Jack's not on. Jack's not on. Remember the old flashcards we used to use? 
That's what you and I do. Yeah, that's, that's what we do. Sign language, here. everything so, in here. Write down what you want to say, Jack, and hold it up. Yeah. Let me draw a gear wheel. <laughs> We're standing by here for just a little bit. See if we can get him. Get him he can always call in with his phone and still leave that camera on. Check one. Check, check. Yep, you you're on, Brian. You got it. Now unmute, Jack. Unmute, Jack. Unmute. People would call him. They might even call Yeah. Unmute. Yeah, you were on, Brian, but I think now you're muted on the – yeah, how about now? Check one. Yep, gotcha. Here we go. And okay, now, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for Jack Liber. Sorry about that. The, uh, if you recall, the state uh, gave uh, us a grant of one billion two hundred one five hundred one for restaurants. Uh, we had a uh, one hundred and forty six restaurants apply. And Commissioner Rothstein, you asked last week what percentage of restaurants out of our whole county, 81%, uh, and I think it's incredible, 81% applied for the grants uh, in, in the county here. Uh, the the uh, What was left over from the money was uh, $226,000, and um, dollars 501 so what we did, we divided the 146, and that came up to one thousand five hundred fifty-one dollars and thirty-eight cents. We we sent out the uh, all the emails uh, uh, Friday night and Saturday morning, and as of the, uh, yesterday, we have received back one hundred and forty-one out of the one hundred and forty-six. There, there's uh, really four outstanding because Brian. Uh, uh, visited uh, one of the owners last night, and the four of us are going to go out to the four restaurants uh, today and tomorrow. So we will have 100% compliance um, uh, as of tomorrow night. We're get, we we sent up, I signed 96 uh, applications yesterday to send them upstairs to accounting, and we'll get the rest of them up uh, tomorrow, So or if not, late as Monday. So we'll have a we'll have a hundred percent on the 146, 146. So uh, it's been a real success when you can get 81 uh, restaurants in 81 percent of Cal County restaurants. And uh, you know the staff has been incredible here with emails and, and you know, actually visiting people, and meeting them on the parking lots. We've been meeting people and filling out the applications to, to get it. So Roberta, we're not going to return any money to the state of Maryland. Uh, yeah, we're going to spend it. We're going to spend the whole, uh, the whole two million, the one million two hundred one. So uh, I just want to thank the staff publicly for all the work they've done. You know, Jack, yeah. outstanding, and uh, you know, definitely a, a season of giving. And so you must feel very good about you and your staff and everything you've done. Um, the one hundred forty six restaurants were those were those that applied and approved or were there more that applied and some were just not approved? We, we approved every single one. Okay. That I think that applied. I think we might've had one or two, but okay. I would, yeah, it was, it was, it was, I think I rejected one for one reason, but there was only right. one, but, right. um, okay. But no, it, it, I, I can tell you one thing I didn't realize, uh, I can tell you the eating habits in uh, Carroll County. Uh, we like Chinese food in Carroll County. Uh, <laughs> so I didn't realize we had so many Chinese Thai restaurants in Carroll County and, and pizza places. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's been really successful, 81%. And, you know, with, you know with, it's like $7.5 million that we've helped businesses. And I, I hope all these restaurants stay in business. And uh, I guess we're waiting for the next round. We'll take a breather for a couple of uh, couple weeks and then hopefully there's another round to help the restaurants again just just uh thank you uh you and your team uh for all this hard work done so thank you i i want to say one thing jack i know you and your team went over and beyond in several cases i uh dealt with some uh, ones that didn't get in there right away or 
I had trouble. You guys went out of your way to help them and get them in. And uh, I think that means a lot to the community. It means a lot to me. And uh, you guys, this doesn't work this way everywhere. And I just want to want to thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for you and your team for what you guys did for these uh, restaurants. Well, I would hope it does work this way everywhere because restaurants will be needed throughout the state. And I can't tell you if a restaurant called and said, we don't know how to fill out the forms or we don't know how to do this or we're missing something, we're not in good state. And we, we've worked with them, held their hand with them and, and did it. But I'm, I'm hoping every county does as well as we do, you know, for, for excess of all restaurants and all businesses. We helped a lot of businesses too, remember. Mr. Lyburn, I didn't realize how much work this was going to be for you and your staff until I visit your office. You gave me a tour. He showed me the stacks and piles of applications. And then to see the quality control process you put in place was, was very helpful and, and ensured that we we're doing the right thing with this procedure, not just throwing money out. So I want to thank you and your crew very much for helping small businesses out. As a small business person, this issue was very dear to my heart. And all I ask is that when you go out to these last restaurants and distribute the balance of the money, make sure you and your crew wear some Santa hats. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to do that or not, but uh, <laughs> and, oh, and and talk, I, talking about Santa, I can tell you on a sidebar, remember Santa's at the farm museum and we had 450 uh, children uh, over this weekend uh, at, at the uh, farm museum, 452 to be exact uh, showed up. Yeah, no, no more than the, Required the health department, but uh, and we're still it's still time for you to go out there and uh, talk to Santa. Yeah. You know. Yeah, Commissioner Weaver put a commercial in for that this morning, Jack. So you're good to go there. So hey. uh, I, I'd like to share that we did submit uh, Jack and his department to the Maryland Association of Counties uh, for their annual awards that uh, all of us typically attend down in Cambridge. Uh, the the um, the official swearing in of all the officers at MACO and the meeting is tomorrow. Uh, and um, while I'm not sure that um, there, I think there were five or six nominations for various programs throughout the state that counties put in. Uh, I I'm, I'm don't know whether we'll be successful there. Tomorrow we'll be, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll know. Uh, but if not, the rest of the state has seen the nomination and what went into the nomination. And uh, that's on the MACO website. So uh, if, if we're not successful with that award, uh, the rest of the state has seen what we have done here in Carroll. Uh, not only with our department down there and Jack, um, everybody down there doing an, an amazing job, but the consistent message that we've given to our businesses and our restaurants we're not through this yet, but our message has been consistent. And if you look around other counties, you know, one week they're doing this, the next week, well, we might do this. The next week they're doing that. Businesses and restaurants are struggling a lot because of inconsistent messages from elected leaders, not here in Carroll. They've been consistent throughout and we've done a great job there. So Jack, uh, we did nominate you, your folks in your department you will get kudos, even if you don't, uh, if you if you haven't won that Mako award. But uh, a tremendous job, job well done. Well, thank you. But uh, we we have received over a hundred awards. Just to let you know, uh, companies have written us letters and thanked us, and restaurants have thanked us, and that's our rewards. And knowing that you know we we've we've helped you know all these companies, so uh, we we have uh, a folder of letters and. That's the rewards that we get just knowing we help one business. Hopefully, we stay in business. You know, that's what we do here. You know, uh, you know, we change people's lives, and hopefully, uh, economic development changes people's lives, and hopefully, uh, you know, we change some of the lives of the restaurants or businesses stayed open. So, well, you know, it's great to get an award, but it's better to help our local people. But thank you for the kudos and everything else. Absolutely, and now's a good time for the another commercial. Restaurants are open. Support them with their outdoor dining. It's actually going to be back up in the 50s next week, okay? 
So there's a lot of outdoor dining going on. Um, we're a little soft here in America. If you go into uh, the European countries, they dine outside all year long. So uh, it, it's very doable. Put the blanket on, and you can easily slice your steak or eat your cheeseburger with gloves on. Just saying. Commissioner Wentz, I want to thank one other person behind the scenes that helped with all this, and that's Administrator Wenham. Uh, she's the one that keeps us on track, she has the legal mind with the JD that, that makes sure we don't go astray, and sometimes we do. I, I know personally I get passionate about subjects, and she's always there behind the scenes to keep us in the, the avenue we should be. And she has been on top of this economic relief plan. She has helped get everything to Jack's department that I need. And I'm very much grateful for what you've done, Roberta. Thank you very much, and Merry Christmas to you. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate it. Yeah, the whole team's been outstanding, and uh, hopefully not if, but when we receive the next round uh, after the first of the year, I think we'll be in pretty good shape to do what we've done here uh, again because uh, we have been so successful, too. So... Uh, you know, you can you, you take all those steps to thank as many people as you can. I mean, I, I feel as if we have one of the best the best grants people in the state too, because I've watched over the over the years that I've been here. Uh, there, there's nobody that does grants like uh, Deb Standiford. Uh, she does she she knows the ins and outs and um, has corrected us on the the why we can't do that part of it too, which I've kind of asked her quite a bit on those so um so the whole team has been amazing and we appreciate that so thank you all right anything else for covid that's it for the crf plan just to say that um yes it has been a, an effort from almost every corner of the county from creating the plan to begin with to implementing the plan to spending the money and everything else and, and of course it all started with your leadership so thank you very much all right, and the, the, the last thing that I have on COVID in general is um, there's still uh, uncertainty as to whether uh, local governments and counties will be receiving any relief funding for our operating budgets. Uh, I employ everybody to reach out to your congressman and, uh, and, and please tell them to try to push through uh, that part of the relief funding. That's incredibly important. I heard Congressman uh, Ruppersberger this morning on BAL, and he's in, in very much in support of that and is working hard to try to make that happen. Uh, but I don't know that that's going to occur. So uh, we, we, we encourage everybody uh, to, um, to con contact the folks down there because that would be a huge help for all of us. So we'll see what, um, We'll see what it brings in the next couple of weeks, and we're hopeful that we get another round for our businesses and restaurants, et cetera. So, uh, but we'll be at the ready if we do. So thank you again to everybody. All right. Uh, let's move on from COVID now and move into uh, – we've got a brief – don't have a whole lot this morning on uh, agenda items. Uh, but uh, the first one that we have listed this morning is the um, – Audit and Comprehensive uh, Annual Financial Report, and I believe I saw Rob Burke on here. I believe Rob. Yeah. Yep, there's Rob, and uh, I'll let Rob introduce Dan. Uh, so, Rob, good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, we'll be uh, briefing the board this morning on the results of the fiscal year uh, 20 audit uh, and uh, Along with that, I'll be releasing in short order here the comprehensive annual financial report, uh, basically our audited financial statements for our year ended uh, June 30, our fiscal year 2020. Uh, on the uh, call this morning is Mr. Dan Kenny. He's the engagement partner for the county with Cone Resnick uh, LLP, which is the independent audit firm that uh, performs the audit service for the county and uh, uh, call on him in a moment here. Uh, I believe Ms. Catherine Welch, the uh, audit manager for Cone Resnick is also on the call. And I wanna express appreciation to both Dan and, and Catherine for their assistance throughout uh, the audit process. 
Uh, just a brief overview, the audit process uh, this year was certainly different and challenging. Uh, the auditors were not on site this year, but were able to conduct their uh, audit of the county's finances remotely and virtually. Uh, so a good bit of technology that we had been putting in place uh, over the past couple years uh, in some ways and using, but uh, certainly uh, was stretched a bit this year to do it completely virtually. Uh, that said, we are um, in the final stages of wrapping up the final edits back and forth. So uh, we'll kind of go over in summary to the board here, since it's your last uh, session for fiscal year 2020, I wanted to get in front of the board, uh, share those uh, results and so forth. The audited financials are uh, due to the state and many of our compliance reporting obligations uh, by year end here uh, over the next two weeks. So we will be doing final edits, releasing uh, publicly the CAFR and the audited statements over the next several days uh, and so forth and getting uh, those out to, uh, again, to our uh, various reporting requirements. Um, so that said, I will uh, ask Mr. Kenny to uh, brief the board on uh, results of the audit, where we stand and um, any, any uh, guidance that he has uh, for the county and so forth. Mr. Kenny. Good morning. Thank you, Rob. Uh, once again, I'm Dan Kenny, partner with Cohn Resnick, and with me is Catherine Welsh, manager with Cohn Resnick, here to present the Carroll County audit as of June 30th, 2020. Um, so I'm going to just talk about three areas. Um, as Rob indicated, uh, your audit should be completed before the holidays, and you're going to see an independent auditor's report. You're going to see an internal control letter and then a those charged with governance letter. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what you're going to see in those. And if you recall, in the independent auditor's report, it just indicates that we've audited the entity as of and for the year end, for the year end of June 30th, 2020. Um, it's going to say that our audit is conducted in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards and government auditing standards. And it's going to indicate that, uh, we issue an unmodified opinion or that the financial statements are fairly presented for the year end. So once again, you received an un unmodified opinion for your audit as of June 30th, 2020. Uh, because the audit is done in accordance with government audited standards, we also issue the report on internal control. And in that internal control report, you'll see there'll be one area where it indicates that there's no instances of noncompliance and then one area is going to have a, a comment um, on the capital project fund. Uh, you have one comment there, and that relates to revenue recognition. And, and we have a recommendation there that uh, management should enhance their process a bit and start looking at it more quarterly uh, because we had a few adjustments that we had to make in that fund. Um, and then in the uh, governance letter, um, that's where it talks about the fact that you don't have any new accounting policies during the year. Um, all the transactions for the year were recorded in the proper period. And then there's six areas where you have estimates or sensitive estimates. And those are the landfill closure and post-closure, um, the depreciation, net pension liability, the other post-employment benefits, um, the health care claims, and then your allowance for your receivables. And of course, in those areas, because they're estimates, we look at the assumptions there and the key factors, and we've determined that they are reasonable as well. Also, you'll see in the in the uh, those charged with governance letter a section on corrected and uncorrected misstatements, and all the corrected misstatements that we identified during the audit have been made. Uh, there were just a few of those, and then the uncorrected misstatements, uh, meaning the there's adjustments that we have that they're not material and they don't have to be posted. Uh, these, those will be identified as well. And those are, those are there's just five of those. Um, and once again, they're not material, so they don't have to be posted. Uh, as Mr. Burke indicated, um, very challenging year uh, with COVID. However, uh, management was very cooperative. Um, we do a lot of work remotely prior to this, so it wasn't that uh, difficult for us uh, but still, it, it's always challenging when you have to be remote, but we work well with the team and, and we want to thank them for, for uh, their cooperation. 
And uh, once again, the statement should be out prior to the holidays and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Right, excellent, excellent report. Any questions for Dan? All right, not hearing any, Rob. So commissioners, I'll just follow up uh, there. So uh, this, uh, as Mr. Kenny mentioned, their audit report will become a part of our uh, financial statements, which will be issued. Uh, we share those with the credit rating agencies and the bond issue uh, community. So uh, these are some of the documents that support uh, the county's AAA credit ratings and uh, are a necessary part to uh, update uh, investors in our bonds. We'll share with them. Uh, I, I will mention, I, I failed to mention before, the um, single audit is a component of the county's financial statement audit as well. That is the audit of uh, federal funds. Uh, generally, the county uh, has conducted and completed that single audit in, in time to include those in our uh, release of our financial statements. Uh, this year, with the uh, CARES Act money and the significant federal dollars that were flowing through the COVID uh, various uh, grants, uh, there was some delay. The, the federal government didn't issue some of the auditing standards uh, in time for us to be able to complete that, to be able to include as we release our financials. So we'll be releasing them in a separate document uh, later, probably I would I guess by the end of January or so. Uh, there's a longer deadline for single audit to be released. And although we usually include it by uh, the end of December in our general release, uh, there's actually a later due date uh, closer to the end of March for a uh, single audit um, release. So uh, that will be separate this year. That's a little different, maybe just a casualty of the uh, significant changes coming out of the federal government with the various CARES relief funds. Um, so with that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we, we believe we're on track to uh, issue our statements here. Uh, we'll also use those to prepare the Maryland Uniform Financial Report. That's due to the state by the end of this month for us as well. Uh, and that is how we report to the state, the county's spending and financial activity. And so that will be uh, done before year end here as well. So again, I want to thank um, you know my department and, and the accounting staff and the team that uh, works on that. It is a, uh, a countywide audit and there's participation by IT and HR and various, uh, certainly in citizen services and many of the agencies uh, that oversee the grants so that many other uh, participants in the audit and I appreciate uh, their help as well. And again, to Cohn Resnick, the team uh, for being flexible and working with us uh, this year, we certainly appreciate it. So uh, with that, no action necessary on behalf of the board, just wanted to brief the board. Uh, it is a successful audit for year end and those numbers will be released soon. Um, historically, I've been uh, up back before the board with a, a wrap-up summary of the finances. Uh, this is certainly an interesting year, so uh, I guess I'll look for guidance to the board whether we want to do that. I know uh, you're going to spend some significant time over the next month or so with uh, Director of Management and Budget Ted Zaleski looking at uh, the, the volatile finances we're, we're in and facing and, and looking forward to the upcoming budget. Um, so I really uh, ask the board for, for your guidance. You don't need to tell me now, but I can certainly come back and do a wrap up. Uh, but a lot of the information from this uh, statements will be included in the, in the data that Ted will be presenting as you all are looking forward to the next budget process. So and with that, uh, appreciate your time. If there's any questions, we can help. Mr. Burke, I know that financial audits are not the most glamorous thing, but they're extremely critical for the integrity of our county. So thank you to you and your staff for what you've done. Yeah, your uh, your your wrap up there of how it's going, to, how it's been an interesting year, will continue to flow into uh, the the beginning half of 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 uh, twenty one. So. Uh, we'll keep you on standby there, Rob, and and I know that a lot of your 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 data will be in that report, and we'll we'll refer to you when we need to. Uh, to um, to to uh, Ms. Welch and Mr. Mr. Kenny, uh, thank you very much. We appreciate your efforts as well. We continue to be very proud of our operations here, and uh, you can see that 
with as a result of our financial positions that we have with our AAA bond rating, which we are ecstatic about and maintaining that, which means a, a ton. And this year, uh, we saw a huge savings as a result of the of the, of the uh, interest rates that we were able to obtain uh, with our bond sale. And uh, you know, all of that, all of that works together in conjunction uh, with your work as well. And we appreciate you uh, making sure that we're we're dotting the i's and crossing the t's, and uh, and uh, and not uh, missing a dollar here in somebody's desk drawer. So thank you all very much for your help. We we truly do appreciate it. So thank you. Uh, our best to you guys for a great holiday as well, and uh, we look forward to working with uh, with you in the future. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. Bye. Thank you, commissioners. Okay. Uh, next on our agenda is the combination of the Behavioral Health Advisory Council and the Senior Opioid Policy Group. And uh, we've got several folks on here to address that or answer any questions. Um, I guess I'll start with you, um, Celine. Uh, don't, I know Ed was on here, but let's start with you and you can sort of introduce this and then we'll work our way through guests if we need, if we need to. So uh, Celine, our Director of Citizen Services, good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, I just wanted to open this up and I'm, I'm going to be brief and then pass it off to the folks at the Health Department with the background. But we, um, as we have been meeting and discussing um, all of the things that surround the opioid crisis um, and we have the opioid intervention team we also have the Behavioral Health Advisory Council, and both of those meetings um, consist of a very similar uh, membership. And as we were looking at that, we talk about similar issues that overlap in many, many cases as well. And it really would make more sense to join those committees together um, and do kind of a crosswalk of the membership that's required on each committee um, and if there's a, a need for additional subcommittees to address specific issues that are um, <clears throat> that are independent of the original purpose of the two separate meetings that were um, uh, created, we would like to um, we'll be able to do that. So this um, request of the commissioners today is um, clearly to just start that process and with your permission and authority to allow us to move forward to do that merge. Um, and I see Ed has popped on and I'm gonna switch it over to him to explain a little bit of the history here um, behind this as well. Good morning, commissioners. And I don't wanna get uh, too deep in the weeds on this, but um, I mean, some of this goes back to uh, four service agencies being formed in, in 1996 and, and uh, um, a law that was signed into effect in 2004, which created a couple of groups, uh, which were a, um, a, a local um, mental health advisory council and a local drug and alcohol advisory council. And the commissioners at the time wrote to the uh, to Governor Ehrlich and asked him if those two committees could be uh, merged. And ultimately, that committee was called the BHAC. Uh, under the governor's executive order with more focus on the opioid crisis, uh, we brought together some, some higher level people. And I, I thought that was a, a really good thing to, uh, to form the uh, opioid intervention teams. As we've, if, as this team's been very effective uh, over, I think very effective over, I'm not sure how many years it's been that we've been doing this now, I think since 2017 and we've brought in emergency management and, um, state's attorney's always been involved, but we brought in the school system and a whole, whole bunch of other uh, stakeholders and even elected officials and whatnot to work in that group. And, and, and the groups have been kind of working on parallel things. And it, it was suggested by, by the membership, essentially, that, that we, we try to merge these together and, and create efficiencies by, um, by ha having essentially the same people that are in a room working on the same issues uh, have that, have that combined into one meeting. So essentially what we're just asking permission for is we're gonna to continue to do the same work. It's just gonna be uh, essentially combining all, all the folks that are involved in these meetings into, into one and, and we think we can be more effective that way. I guess uh, 
Ned Coin I saw was on here, and he's been involved with us uh, since the very beginning. I'm not sure if uh, if Ned wants to go next, or if Valerie has a few things to say, or if uh, if Sue has some comments. But I, I think you have essentially what we're looking to do in your briefing paper, and, and pretty well describes it. So I, I, unless you have questions, I, I'll go ahead and let some other folks uh, give you their thoughts. And, and I know Mr. Fraser's been involved as well, so. I think um, uh, if, if someone can answer the, the question or the concern that if these merge, I appreciate the efficiencies, but it will not dilute the efforts done on either side. And we'll actually, uh, by combining them, we'll provide and strengthen the, the value uh, of focus on both sides. That's the, you know, that, that's my biggest concern is, you know, sometimes we're short-sighted by combining things um, and we're looking for efficiencies, but there's such a, a need out there and a requirement out there that we focus on both both issues. I, I just want to make sure we don't dilute those. Um, so that can be addressed. And uh, I think that, you know, that, that'll allow us to make a, a good decision. Um, Commissioner, I, I guess I'll comment first. And, and uh, Commissioner Frazier has been sitting on, I think been sitting on this group for a while and, and maybe he can comment on this as, as well. But I, I think, you know, we're, we're really, what, what this group does is, is gives oversight to what we do at the health department is in Sue's role as the local behavioral health authority and also has been serving a coordinating role in all the activities that are going on throughout the county um, for, for these uh, for activities related to um, behavioral health. And, and I think we're in a really good place because uh, we look at it as being all one system. I don't think the state really even has it together at, at, to any great, great extent. You know, you can't just look at opioids. And, and unfortunately, I think sometimes the money and, and some of the short-sightedness, even at the state and federal level, just wants to look at opioids. And a lot of these folks have uh, co-occurring conditions and a lot of other issues that need to be looked at it as, as a whole person as opposed to just individually. I just think that that, that all of our efforts in behavioral health, it's, 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 it's a... It's a uh, it's, it's all interrelated. And, and I think that uh, combining these is not going to take anything away, but I'll, I'll let some other folks share their thoughts because they're members of this group and, and, and uh, I don't know who wants to go next or how you want to organize this, but I, I don't want, want this just to be my discussion. I'll jump in since you mentioned my name like four times, uh, <laughs> but I will jump in. Most of the people that are on opioids or other drugs that aren't on it because they were prescribed pain medication or something. The the people that are left are probably on there because they're self-medicating for some some um, issue that they have with mental health. And because they're self-medicating with that, that's a tremendous reason to put these two groups together. Because behavioral health, usually underlying cause of drug addiction is some type of mental health issue. So putting these two groups together, it just makes sense It'll work better. Like Ed said, let's look at the whole person, not just part of what's going on here. Look at everything together. I, and I and I think it was already mentioned that most of the people in one group are already on the other group anyway. It just makes sense to combine them much more efficient. And I think it would be much better looking at the entire person and what they're, what they're going through, not just one aspect at a time. Yeah, well said, uh, Dennis. I had the, 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 the honor of, of kind of being out of the gate uh, when I was elected back in 14, a servant on this group too, and uh, noticed that there were, there was um, the same people coming to both meetings. You know, we're so quick to put together teams and, and, and groups and, and that kind of thing, but time is a precious commodity and I am not a big fan of duplicity. And I've watched that over the years that I've been here where we'll put this group together and they're doing the same thing that that group over there that we put together three months ago is doing. And then that group that we put together six months ago is doing the same. So duplicity just is, it, it bogs the system down. And I think, um, I think Dennis, you made some good points. I mean, you can focus on the whole instead of just the, the person uh, and the, the ability to bring all those folks together under one umbrella I think is huge, and I'm I'm in 
I'm in a big support of doing something that eliminates that phase of, of duplicity. Uh, Ned, you've been on this for a while. Uh, comments from you, sir? Sorry, it took me a minute to unmute. Um, yes, I've been on the, I've been representing the state series office on this committee uh, for since 2005. And there, there is a lot of work that goes on. There's a lot of coordination of different services by government, nonprofit, state, local, uh, local and state governments. So, um, and, and I also attended the senior opioid um, committee as well. So I think this, this will um, still represent all of the interests of mental health addiction and community providers the, the um, consumers and um, parents of consumers will also be represented well on this committee, the members of both. And one of the big things is that at the senior opioid meeting, the hospital comes and it's more than just um, one representative. A lot of times there's multiple representatives and they've done a lot of work in the last few years of getting peers and everything else coordinating with the health department. So it really does, this collaboration is represented um, at senior opioid and, and by merging them, it, it, nothing, in my opinion, nothing will be lost. Valerie? Hear you too good. Yeah, you're. Valerie, we're having trouble hearing you. Yeah, you're. We can. You're. You're not muted, but your 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 right. microphone's way down. A little bit better. Uh, yeah. All if, right. If, I'll try to get a little bit closer. There you That's go. Great. If you yell, right. like you yell. If you yell like you yelled at me last night about how the ridiculousness of this storm is, we'll be able to hear you, Valerie. Go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I'll just say that I, uh, that what I want to say is, is tied right into and, and works well with what uh, Ned just mentioned. I don't think that we're going to be losing anything by doing this. I really think that because, every, because the two committees are so interconnected, because the issues are so interconnected, we'll actually have a benefit from doing this. Uh, as opposed to, to losing anything. Certainly, I, I've been in similar situations, Commissioner Watson, where you do this and it, and it is just a time saver. It isn't really meeting the needs of, of the, the issues that you're trying to address. Uh, this is not one of those situations. I, I truly believe that doing this is going to be more of a help than it is going to be an increase. Okay, thanks. Sue, anything to add from your, uh, from your desk? <laughs> Yeah, the only thing I'd love to add is that the group has the senior opioid policy group, the opioid intervention team, whichever we're calling it, has been awesome at um, looking at the whole person and not just addressing the opioid issues and ensuring that we're um, saying back to the different funders that it's not appropriate to just look at one of these issues at a time, that we need to be comprehensive in our approach. And I think that uh, because we're taking that approach and we're including prevention in, in, in all of our efforts that um, this will make some really good efficiencies and also people who had to attend two meetings in one month and hear the same thing will be very grateful. Thanks, Sue. Dennis? I'll make a motion, if, if we're ready for that point, that the Board of Commissioners allow the merger, merger of the Behavioral Health Advisory Council and the Opioid Intervention Team into one council. Second. Got a motion and second. Any additional questions or discussion for anybody on the panel here? All right, hearing none, all those in favor. And that is a unanimous decision. Uh, continue your good work, folks. You, you, you do an amazing job, and I've, I've seen it firsthand, and so have a lot of our citizens. So thank you, and we wish you the best of luck uh, with the merger. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Happy holidays, everybody. Valerie, Ned, everybody, Sue. Thank you. All right. Uh, next on our agenda is additional grant funding uh, for refresh and expansion of 911 dispatch. And I see that our Director of Public Safety, Scott Campbell, has uh, gotten off of his toboggan that he used to get here this morning out of PA and uh, is with us live. Scott, good morning. Good morning, Commissioner. Before we get started, I just wanted to say I was very disappointed last night. I saw, uh, I'll call it an ATV-style vehicle with a little snow plow in front of it, et cetera, and I thought maybe you came up to help clean all my snow away, and when it went right past my house, I realized it was a, a fleeting thought. So thank you, if I anyone. Couldn't, I couldn't see the numbers on the house, so I wasn't sure I had to write one. So there you go. 
I assure you mine's properly marked. Not everyone up there is, but mine is. Well, commissioners, <laughs> thank you for allowing me, uh, I will say, to get on this at a last minute. Um, and I will gladly explain why we thought it was necessary to get on early. Uh, the fact that there will not be a, uh, an open session for some time. We wanted to present what we have today now so that we didn't have to wait several weeks. Specifically, uh, on October 1st, we were in front of the board and presented to you, and you subsequently accepted, a, an offer from the Maryland 911 board of $2,581,304.29 for a complete 911 telephone system refresh, as well as the expansion necessary to accommodate the additional consoles. Candidly, uh, during a subsequent contract review, after everything had been signed, we were moving forward, and it came time to schedule work, it was realized a component was missing. That component is the necessary cabling, which as we speak, uh, Jack Brown is waiting for his opportunity virtually to present the request for $40,095.08 to handle 100% uh, of the cost of the required cabling and hardware. Unfortunately, I, I wish I could tell you, I guarantee, guarantee you this funding will be provided, but as you all know, uh, monies from the Maryland 911 board are not guaranteed, uh, meaning it may have be administratively clear there is no objective reason to not fund this, but until they make the motion and approve it, that's the first that we can say we have the money. So it should be an administrative issue. It, again, it was part of the contract review that recognized that the cabling, the um, CAT-6 cabling, et cetera, that's necessary uh, was not included in the original scope, nor the cost. It wasn't like it was built into the cost, but not specified as a requirement to be work accomplished. So at this time, I, I have no choice but to ask you to please consider accepting the reimbursement conditional upon with the anticipated approval of, of the Maryland 911 board. And again, it's timely because by doing so, we think we're going to know before uh, the afternoon is out that it has been accepted and we can move forward with those funds, use those monies. So with that, Commissioner, um, I ask the board to please accept $40,095.08 from the Maryland 911 board conditional upon their approval today to provide that funding. Okay, any questions for Scott? All right, well, I'm gonna make the motion that we accept the requested reimbursement from the Maryland 911 board, conditional on, on of course, on their approval, as well as authorize uh, Director of Public Safety to award the additional work and approve the payment of the resulting invoices. Second. Okay, got a motion and second. Any other discussion? All those in favor, unanimously approved. Go get the money, Scott. Thank you, commissioners. And Jack, hopefully, let me maybe have the opportunity to tune back in and say we've got the money. Thank you. Okay. All right. It, this was kind of like we bought a car but forgot to put wheels on it. And, and with all due respect, commissioner, um, we were quite surprised that the required cabling wasn't included in the scope of work, but uh, the to be candid, the telephone vendor, the, the cabling aspect is not something they did. They do everything else. So it wasn't in their contract. It was not built into their price, which is why Jack's asking for the additional funding for a cat, a cat six cabling vendor. We won't hold it against you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Good luck. All right. That brings us to the end of the agenda items. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of agenda reviews to do, but I will go over those. Uh, before we do that, is there anything open admin? Not, not, not seeing a lot of open admin. Uh, I do have one item. Um, it's been an incredibly challenging and hectic year, and uh, it has been an honor and a privilege, and I... Uh, truly thank my colleagues for putting your faith in me to steer us through these meetings over the last two years. Uh, I've, um, I've enjoyed it at times. There have been times that I haven't enjoyed it, um, but uh, that comes with the territory. Uh, but I will tell you that it has been an honor to represent uh, the four of you as the president uh, of this board. And um, 
it will forever be ingrained in my memories uh, it's to the opportunity that I had here, and I truly do uh, appreciate that. So I want to thank each of you, and um, we'll see where we um, end up in 21. I hope it's in a better place with this COVID and everything else, but uh, I have the utmost, utmost faith in uh, my successor, uh, Commissioner Rothstein will be rolling in here and uh, taking over the helm. And um, again, my, my thanks to the four of you for allowing me to, uh, to function in this position and uh, look forward to the years to come here. Two to go. President Wentz, I want to thank you for your service. I think as we went into this emergency with the pandemic, your background with emergency services was spot on. I don't think we could have had a better person out of this board to fit in that position. And I think all five of us are coming through this better than we had went into it. Uh, I've grown as a commissioner and I like the interaction we've had. I've always said that sometimes it's like being brothers. We might fight and argue, but at the end of the day, we love one another. And I'm very sincerely grateful for the service you provide as president of this board. And I'm looking forward to serving with President Rothstein for the next two years. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. All right. Anything else for open admin? All right. Let's quickly go through the agendas. Uh, next week, the week of December the 21st, uh, December the 22nd, Tuesday at 8 a.m. Uh, I'm sorry. At 1 p.m., we have a comprehensive, um, another comprehensive work session. Uh, that's as a part of our rezoning uh, adventure that we are in. I think we have, oh, 10 or 11 more properties and a couple that we put on hold for additional information. And uh, we hope to get through those uh, next Tuesday at um, beginning at 1 p.m. Uh, the rest of the week, uh, nothing on our calendars. A reminder uh, that the county offices will be closed on both Thursday and Friday next week in observance of the holiday. And Commissioner Boucher has the podcast for next week. Uh, the week after that, the week of December the 28th, uh, we don't have anything on the calendar. There is absolutely nothing. Now, with that being said, uh, all five of us will be actively engaged in making sure that we have the latest statistics, as we talked about today. We'll be sharing those with you, and um, we will be back in the offices physically. Well, a reminder that the offices are closed that week as well on both Thursday and Friday in observance of the new year, which has got to be better than this last year. Got to be. Um, and Commissioner Rothstein, fittingly enough, who will be uh, taking over as president on uh, the, the first of the year, has the podcast. Anything else for open admin? All right, I need a motion to go in to closed for land acquisition. Motion to go into closed for land acquisition. Sorry. Second. Third. All right, got a motion in three seconds on that. Apparently we're gonna look at land acquisition, all of us. Uh, all right, um, all those in favor? Okay, and then I need an, a motion to uh, adjourn after that. Motion to adjourn. Um, Second. All right. And all those in favor? All right. I finally got something right at the end of being asking for the right stuff. Thank you very much. It's been a while. For it only took two years, Steve. You yeah. did it. <laughs> yeah, two, two years, you know, finally. So, all right. Listen, um, from all of us to all of you, we wish everyone the best and safest holiday season. Uh, happy holidays. Uh, happy Kwanzaa. Merry Christmas uh, to everyone, and a happy, happy, happy New Year. Um, and uh, remember, we saw an uptick in numbers as, as uh, with COVID after Thanksgiving. So, um, you know, the only way that I can say this is, for the love of God, please continue to do best practices. Wear these things, please. Wash your hands. Social distance, 
and we will get through this. That light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccines, it's there. Be distributing as soon as we can to uh, in the order in which you heard today. So we, we do think that we'll be in a much better spot this time next year. Uh, let's, let's hope so. But to everyone on behalf of the county, uh, our best for a great holiday hey, Steve, Ed? I, I apologize. Are we reconvening this afternoon or not? Uh, we're going to discuss that uh, right after this. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss that in our land acquisition. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, with that said, everyone, uh, our best. We'll see you in 2021 with uh, our next open session. And uh, let us know, Chris, when we are uh, off the air. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you.